Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm Betsy Bartholet, the faculty director of the TAP program, Child Advocacy Program here at Harvard Law School. Um, we're thrilled to have so many of you interested in the last of our graduate um, program research workshops. And the only thing I really want to say is that the whole vision for uh, this set of um, research workshops um, was that of Mary Wellstead, and um, she has also been the person who has made it happen. And I think as we come to the end of this year that um, it's been a huge contribution to the TAP program and really, therefore, to the students. So I just really, really want to thank her very much for doing it. Um, well, I would also like to welcome you all. Um, anybody who has been to any of these semin previous seminars know that this is very much about work in progress. Um, and today, uh, Rick has chosen this wonderful title, The Chocolate Heist. I feel we should all be rewarded with chocolate at the end of it. Um, and uh, Rick is going to talk to us about the Hershey Trust and its transformation from a charity uh, for children in need of residential education into something else. And Rick will tell you what the something else is. Um, it's unrecognizable uh, from what it was set up to do. Um, Rick has also asked me to say that he has a particular personal interest in this because Rick himself spent seven years um, as a residential student in the uh, Hershey Institution. So uh, Rick is going to talk for half an hour, and then we'll open it to um, comment, discussion, and I'm sure we'll get off it. Rick. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for attending today's talk. Uh, thanks especially to the CAP folks, uh, Professors Bartholet and Budnitz, and Professor Wellstead for arranging the event. Of course, uh, I owe a special uh, debt of gratitude this year to the law school for having uh, given me the opportunity to spend some time here to reflect on the issues that we're about to discuss. The Hershey Trust story is highly complex. Uh, it's dense with child care issues, charitable trust law, corporate governance, uh, attorney general oversight. Um, the first time that you encounter it, it's a bit like taking a sip from a fire hydrant. Um, nonetheless, I'll try to focus on the key issues uh, as quickly as possible and then address uh, areas of particular interest to you during the Q&A. Uh, my hope is that we will have a good dialogue and that you'll challenge my positions uh, wherever you like. Uh, I was going to begin by putting up a complicated uh, flow chart describing the Hershey Trust. Uh, but I realized that the only place to start uh, really is with the founder of this charity, uh, Milton S. Hershey. Uh, here he is with one of the uh, boys uh, uh, from the uh, orphanage. Uh, born in 1857, Mr. Hershey was a Mennonite farm boy. His formal education ended in fourth grade. His father was an alcoholic and his family moved many times in his youth. By all accounts, he was a, deeply, a, a, a decent and simple man, kind but firm, self-effacing, even though uh, tremendously successful, unpretentious, profoundly charitable. Uh, he cared about his workers, his community, and most of all, his orphanage. Uh, he struggled in the confectionery business, going bankrupt three times before being vindicated in his view that the masses too, and not just the rich, would buy chocolate if it were made affordable. His success would produce America's largest chocolate empire and fund his charitable work. He was clear that the purpose of business is to help others. His wife, Catherine, predeceased him by 30 years, and they had no children. By his own account, his life's primary work would be to save as many orphan children as possible. As he very touchingly put it, I fill up and can't talk when I think of their broken homes. I would give everything I possess to be able to call one of these boys my own. In fact, he did give virtually everything he possessed to these children. He was a student of child care matters in his time, and he built his uh, children's home on four pillars based on what he had learned. All of these things were cutting edge uh, in that era. One, the facility would serve orphan children. This is a term of art that often is misunderstood as uh, being a child without living parents. In fact, it means a child requiring uh, residential care. The school would take full responsibility for clothing, feeding, educating, and otherwise meeting the children's needs, not giving up on them when things got difficult. Second, the facility would shatter the traditional orphanage model. This is really important. There would be no dormitories, no congregation, no crowding, isolation, or segregation of any kind. Instead, the children would live in natural settings 
and family-like homes throughout the community, each unique and headed by a married house-parent couple. There was no campus of any kind, let alone uh, the warehouse type of building that we often associate with uh, traditional orphanages. As Mr. Hershey said, uh, I want these boys to grow up with a feeling that they have a real home. The homes were breathtakingly beautiful, and the children uh, lived in them, uh, played in nearby fields, fished and trapped in streams and ponds. Uh, at the risk of personalizing this, I have to say that uh, we never had any sense that we were kids at some kind of an orphanage uh, from the perspective of where we lived. On the contrary, we felt like what uh, Dylan Thomas describes in his poem, uh, Fern Hill. We were princes of the Appletown, famous among the barns about the happy yard, and singing as the farm was home. I'm not trying to romanticize what we faced. There were certainly some, some bad things to be sure. But I am telling you that of all the places you could have landed as a child separated from your family, the facilities that Mr. Hershey created were, were every child's dream, uh, regardless of family status or wealth. The play space and natural settings were among the charity's greatest assets and tools for healing children who had experienced what those in uh, child care referred to as the trilogy of pain, loss, uh, abandonment, and, uh, and, and separation. Uh, the third pillar of uh, Mr. Hershey's model was a farm program with children milking cows and doing healthy farm chores. The goal was character building and instilling a work ethic, not training farmers. Mr. Hershey himself, late in his life, would stop by his, farmer, his neighbor's farms and help with the milking. He believed in the, uh, the, the dignity of work, and he wanted the children uh, at the uh, facility to, to uh, learn the same, <coughs> same values. Um, the program worked and helped mold generations of troubled youth into better individuals. Uh, there's ample support in the child care literature to show that this, this really did make sense. A vocational education curriculum was also provided so that alumni could secure good jobs when they graduated, even if they were not going to college. Again, this made sense then and now. I myself saw countless children who never had a hope of going to college, uh, but they were good kids then, and today they hold decent jobs and care for their families uh, because of the trades that they learned at the school, plumbing, carpentry, uh, auto mechanics. And others went on to, to college. The point was there was no discrimination in the type of child served because of their academic potential. This model had all the makings of a unique facility for saving children's lives and evolving into a broader catalyst for larger child care good. In other words, the amount of resources that you had here should have funded what is referred to today as catalytic philanthropy, where you leverage the resources to, to pursue all sorts of other programs. You don't have just one tool in the toolbox. You can have your, your nurse visitation program. You can have your, your, your adoption support services. You can do all of it because there's so much there. So long as the charity stewards meet the, the normal standards uh, of, uh, of uh, duties of care, loyalty, and obedience to charitable mission. Where they fail to meet this duty, of course, we have the, parents pay, the attorney general with its parents' patriotic responsibility, father of the state responsibility, to backstop the charitable board and make sure that they fulfill the charity's mission. This is a simplified uh, picture of the uh, 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 Hershey Trust structure. I won't dwell on it other than to note that it provided ample funding for the charity and held title to the charity's 12,000 or so acres of uh, land. But it also had built into it the seeds of the problems that would later emerge. These problems have included people finagling their way onto this child care charitable board, not because they cared about the trust child saving mission, but basically because they uh, wanted to access the vast wealth uh, that the charity also had. Uh, the company Herco, Hershey Entertainment Resorts is a prime example. The Hershey Company itself, uh, the Hershey Trust Company, um, these were all entities that could compete with the children's home for resources if the uh, if the uh, stewards of the charity went astray. So there you have it, a unique child saving model, 12,000 acres of land, vast amounts of cash, uh, a trust board duty bound to save needy children, legions of needy children to serve, and an AG uh, attorney general backstopping the board in case anything went astray. So what's not to like? Well, if things went as planned, this talk would have a different title. Uh, but if you refract the actual Hershey Trust events, through the prism of this ch charity's child-saving mission, they make no sense at all. If you refract the same events through the prism of uh, uh, self-enrichment for the charity stewards, advancement of political and economic agendas, pursuit of non-child goals, then the, uh, the events do make sense. Or, to use a metaphor from uh, the movie Avatar, the kids in the orphanage were like the Navi, peacefully dwelling in their Hershey Trust Pandora, living close to nature, enjoying wide open play spaces, 
and a sense of belonging to the community, but also sitting on vast amounts of unobtainium, that is 12,000 acres of pristine land coveted by local developers and businesses, along with large amounts of orphanage cash. These businesses included the very companies that we saw in the Hershey Trust governance chart, businesses uh, simultaneously managed by the trust board, who then had to choose between kids and the companies. So uh, what does the RDA Corporation in Avatar do to get at the unobtainium? Why, it brings out the heavy artillery. Uh, but unlike in the movie, in Hershey, the Navi get routed. Let's start with 1963. Uh, does this building look anything like a childcare facility? Uh, the answer, of course, is no. It is the uh, medical school of Penn State University and a related 484-bed hospital. The question to ask is how $50 million of childcare money and 500 acres of orphanage land managed to be handed scot-free to Penn State University to build this medical school and hospital, because that is exactly what happened. The answer is a charitable trust doctrine called uh, CPRE, wherein a trustee petitions a court to change the use of a charitable bequest when the original bequest has failed. So if Bill and Melinda Gates leave a million dollars to a glaucoma charity and a cure for glaucoma is discovered, the charity's trustees can petition to use the funds for something as near as possible to the original intent, maybe retinal uh, disease. In Hershey, there was no failure of purpose whatsoever. Sad to say, uh, our nation has long teamed with children who need residential care then and now. In any case, by no stretch was a gift a, a, a gift to Penn State for medical school uh, for a medical school as near as possible to Mr. Hershey's child saving mission. The chairman of the Hershey Trust Board was also on the board of Penn State. I'm sure you can picture how the related board discussions went as this group convinced themselves that this was an acceptable use of charitable trust resources. So where was the attorney general protector of the defenseless in all this? Well, the attorney, the attorney general joined the petition. They actually worked it out in advance at the judge's house before the hearing. The AG and the trustee filed their petition in the morning, specifically to make sure no one had a chance to challenge their positions. And by afternoon, $50 million and 500 acres of land had left this charity uh, and the nation's largest CPRE petition grant in history uh, took place. Uh, from there, things got worse. The needy Navi children never had a chance. Let's go to 1970. The opening of this building, uh, constructed from opulent uh, Itali uh, uh, marble, Italian and Vermont. You have to look at the doorway down there to really get a sense of how big it is. This thing is huge. Uh, it had the second largest unsuspended dome in the Western Hemisphere at the time, after only the nation's capital. Uh, this changed with the advent of dome sports stadiums. The rotunda alone required 1,550 tons of marble. It's the second largest rotunda in the world. Uh, the building is a virtual public resource, attracting 50,000 visitors each year and serving local college and high school graduations. Pennsylvania elected officials hold functions here and it hosts countless other events, totally unrelated to this charity's child-saving mission. The $50 million spent on this uh, came from needy kids. How a child care charitable board could justify this spending at a time when thousands of children were being warehoused across the country in hideous facilities is a total mystery. But the real question is, where were the Pennsylvania officials at this time? Well, here's one, Dick Thornburg. Governor Thornburg in 1979 held his uh, first uh, inaugural gala ball at Founders Hall, this very building. He later boasted of saving taxpayer money by foregoing a public parade that day. He might have also boasted that he saved money on the waiters uh, serving him and his guests food and drink that night. The waiters were uncompensated children ordered to go and serve Thornburg's guests uh, by the charity stewards. Uh, they were also the parking lot attendants that night. They were also the cleanup crew. I'm not trying to ridicule Governor Thornburg or be mean-spirited, uh, but the point is that when public officials enjoy availing themselves of questionable decisions by a charity's board, they're hardly in a position uh, later to insist on, on, on better conduct from the charity. Uh, in addition, it gives you a sense of how these kids are really viewed by the local establishment. They're invisible, they're uh, you know, uncompensated conscripts. Uh, the attitude continues to this very day, as we'll see uh, when we get to the end of this lecture. So now let's uh, jump to the 1980s through the early 2000s. Uh, and I'm trying to walk you through this charity's, uh, uh, this, uh, charity's history as briefly, as, as quickly as possible. Um, so what did the board decide to do? Well, they did five things. First, 
they decided that needy children really don't like living in natural settings with open play spaces, fun things like creeks and ponds, or the feeling that they live like normal kids in a community. So the board removed the children from the town and telescoped them into a con congregated centralized compound, segregating them from the community in a location devoid of all natural settings uh, that the children had once enjoyed. Basically, they put these kids into an expensively constructed and crowded jumble of group homes piled one on top of another so that all these kids could see uh, around them were other uh, children just like themselves. Second, the board decided to cut the enrollment of the school. Third, they gutted the vocational education program, and there's a reason for that because of the type of child that they wanted to serve. Uh, fourth, they closed down the entire farm program. Uh, fifth, they made a conscious decision to openly reject orphan children foster care children, wards of the court, and all of the other hardest luck and neediest cases. They had been drifting in this direction for many years. Instead of these kids, the board decided to recruit what they deemed a better class of child, one that could make uh, it in the kind of prep school setting that they were building. At the time, one administrator smugly told me that I would not have been enrolled under the new criteria, and he was right. I, was not, uh, I would not likely be enrolled today, given that I had been held back in school. I was usually removed from classrooms, if Professor Barthlett thinks it was difficult having me as a, in her class, can you imagine what they went through uh, for being disruptive and otherwise uh, acting out in the way that kids from these backgrounds often uh, do. Uh, the administrator's reward for telling me this was to uh, essentially spark in me uh, the reform uh, project that I have uh, continued to this very day. Um, these decisions gave the board easier ch children to handle and freed vast tracts of land for development, local housing, and <clears throat> other non-child goals while bestowing a $400 million bonanza on the local construction industry. They spent $400 million to telescope these kids into this smaller campus. That's very important to note because the big question is how they had so much money and why are they uh, serving so few children. The answer is that they make ridiculous uh, asset uh, resource uh, uh, use decisions and this is one of them. In other words, RDA Corporation got huge amounts of unobtainium, both land and cash, while needy children, the Navi, got to live in a sterile and segregated uh, centralized compound, some trade-off. But the worst was yet to come. In the fall of 2002, the Attorney General finally took action against these trustees. Okay? This is, should be the good part of the story. Uh, but did the Attorney General act against them for fiscal waste? For, no, for poor child care policies, for crowding the children, for rejecting the neediest children, none of the above. The Attorney General and the local orphans court uh, judge removed 10 trustees from the board for the offense of seeking to diversify the charity's portfolio. In other words, the 10 were made to walk the plank for what was perhaps the only thing they had done that had actually helped needy kids. In the process, Attorney General Fisher forced onto the board one of his Republican political cronies, former Pennsylvania Attorney General Leroy Zimmerman. So a charity that for five decades has, uh, has uh, suffered from a lack of Attorney General attention now has a two-term Attorney General forced onto its board, just what this dysfunctional charity needed. At the time, I literally begged the uh, public officials to name one residential child care professional to the board of this $7 billion residential child care charity. Uh, I was completely ignored as non-child interests ruled the day. Uh, these incidents have been condemned by numerous uh, charitable trust scholars. Uh, Professor Evelyn Brody of Kent, uh, uh, Chicago Kent College of Law said the Hershey case shows each of the three branches of Pennsylvania government acting illegitimately. The Attorney General practically treated the trust assets as his uh, campaign funds. The Hershey case illustrates that the value of narrowly confined, that is, residential child care assets, does not disappear. It gets appropriated by those with power at their disposal. Closer to home, Harvard Law School's own Professor Robert Sitkoff, together with his Penn Law colleague Jonathan Click, wrote a very important study explaining how the Attorney General's intervention destroyed roughly $2.7 billion of shareholder wealth and perpetuated an ownership uh, structure that harms the interests of both public shareholders and needy kids alike. That's some achievement for an Attorney General. Now we turn to the latest act and, of the Hershey drama. Uh, this is June 26, 2003. The curtain rises with the board rescinding a package of child care and governance reforms that had been imposed a mere 11 months earlier. Uh, the reforms were not the work of the Attorney General, but of two dedicated subordinates, Mark Pasella and Linda Williams, who basically had to overcome uh, Fisher's resistance to gain uh, even this reform package. Though it was far less than what many of us had wanted, 
The reforms at least would have ended board conflicts of interest. Limited trustee self-enrichment provided some anti-crowding protections uh, for children and otherwise forced the board to focus on the, uh, uh, the charity's child-saving mission. When the board rescinded these reforms in an act that was absolutely flabbergasting to anybody observing it, we alumni Navi knew exactly what this would lead to, that the RDA Corporation would use the free freedom that they gained to seize even more unobtainium land and cash, and that the charity would become even more dysfunctional. So we tried to prevent it by petitioning the Orphans Court. Uh, we asked the court to have the Attorney General and the Trust Board come into court and defend in a meaningful hearing why it was acceptable to uh, shred uh, governance reforms that were supposed to uh, end uh, six decades of charitable trust misconduct. Uh, our petition was not well received. The judge, the Honorable Warren G. Morgan, the same judge who presided over the removal of the 10 trustees, declared that our petition was less a pleading than a diatribe it impugns the integrity of the Attorney General and insultingly disparages the new board. Its claims regarding the dire consequences that will follow from the rescinding of the reform agreement are conjectural and extravagant. We believe that the filing of uh, the petition was improvident. He also said that our prayer for relief was preposterous, something that the local media and our critics have relished uh, citing over and over and over. Uh, not exactly a career highlight for me. So, seven years later, were the claims in our petition uh, conjectural and extravagant? Well, in my view, the period 2003 through 2010 for this charity could make a good reality uh, TV show. We could call it Trustees Gone Wild. And where does it begin? Well, it begins at the top with board compensation spinning out of control. By rescinding this reform agreement, the trustees were able to appoint themselves to these um, lucrative, lucrative related company boards. You have the board chairman uh, amassing a total compensation package of $503,833. Uh, James Nevels, another person that joined the board uh, at that time, uh, $430,500. Robert Cavanaugh, an alumnus of the school, $315,000. How does the Hershey Trust Board total compensation figure compare with that of the nation's eight largest not-for-profit uh, educational institutions? Let's do a comparison here. Well. Uh, on the left, uh, weighing in at 239 board members, we have the boards of Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Columbia, Princeton, MIT, Penn, and Cornell. Altogether, they share $2,500 annually. And on the right, we have uh, weighing in at eight board members, the uh, Hershey Trust Board. Uh, they share $1,887,558, not exactly reflective of the uh, charitable uh, values of Mr. Hershey. Uh, does it stop at uh, compensation uh, issues? No, it does not. Uh, what were some of the things that they did? Uh, some of these folks played golf on a local uh, luxury golf course. It became insolvent. No problem. They used child care money to buy the, uh, the uh, golf course out of insolvency and renovate its clubhouse. Uh, Milton Hershey School children are barred from setting foot on it. When asked why they did this, they declared it was to create a buffer between the kids and the community. Terrific childcare reason for buying a, a, a golf course. They subsidized another local golf course at a cost of $300,000 a year annually. Uh, the medical center, the building that we saw earlier, uh, was doing some kind of a new addition, so they funneled a million dollars to it via controlled company Herco. In 2006 and 2009, they funneled another million through, controlled, uh, through the Hershey Company. Uh, they've used the uh, charity's resources for partisan political purposes. For example, they held a Republican fundraising dinner at Mr. Hershey's mansion, of all places, honoring Karl Rove. When we pointed out that this was not proper, they issued a statement saying, we did nothing wrong, but we've changed our policies to never do it again. Uh, I'm told that they've been funneling money to the Pennsylvania Republican Party through Herco, this wholly owned company. Uh, is there political cronyism uh, involved here? Well, let's look at the chart we saw earlier. The Hershey Trust Company, uh, Republican uh, Attorney General, former Attorney General Roy Zimmerman joins. Shortly thereafter, James Nevels, uh, a prominent Pennsylvania Republican, is named to that board. The Hershey Entertainment Resorts Company, Lynn Swan, Republican uh, uh, nominee for uh, uh, Pennsylvania governor, is named to that board. Hershey Company, Tom Ridge, former Republican governor, uh, Director of Homeland Security for, for George Bush. 
uh, at the Milton Hershey School itself. It could be a coincidence, uh, but the general counsel, Jim Sheehan, happened to also have been the former general counsel for uh, Republican Governor Tom Ridge, and I'm not uh, by any ways casting aspersions. I'm simply saying that it's amazing how many Republicans all of a sudden start showing up up and down this charity, and I don't know if anybody came to CAP and said, we've got this position at the $7 billion residential child care charity. Can you recommend some young lawyers who, who actually might help us use these resources for needy kids? So, uh, other things. Let's see. Um, what is the child care scorecard? Because frankly speaking, I could probably overlook all of this if they were serving needy kids well. And I, in fact, did make the mistake of trying to bargain and negotiate and deal with these people as though um, you know, we could get uh, something in exchange. In fact, um, the trustees gone wild era uh, child care scorecard is the worst part of this whole story. First of all, they hired a, a school president, even though during the vetting process they discovered that for years he'd been falsely claiming to hold a master's degree in psychology. He basically had been selling leadership seminars to corporations. There was nothing in his background as a child care or an educational leader that would have given you any idea that he could lead this uh, charity. His total compensation in 2009 was $673,867. Time prevents me from telling you about some of the, of the indulgences that went with this. You can ask about that during the Q&A if you like. Other administrators were similarly checkered with, with checkered backgrounds were also hired. One administrator had been fired uh, in the past. Another had left under a cloud of controversy. Another had no qualifications for the position for which he was hired. Basically, these guys, uh, sad to admit, were alumni. And when the alumni Navi had a reform movement uh, going the way we did, the only way to uh, undermine us was to take some of our own and put them in prominent positions whether or not they were qualified. They increased child crowding. They increased the number of kids per group home. They broke promises about this. Uh, some of these promises were in the reform agreement that they uh, rescinded. Uh, the competition is fierce, but first prize for fiscal recklessness and child care foolishness is Springboard Academy, an 80-child bunker that they built with 20-child bedrooms. And the idea was they would take these kids, they took 80 newly enrolled children, stuck them in this one separated, uh, congregated place uh, away from everybody else, and they would keep them there for a year before moving them, moving them into the uh, student homes with the uh, house parent couples. It made no sense. It turned back the child care clock 100 years. Everybody told them that was the case. And uh, timing is wonderful. Last week, they finally admitted that it's a fiasco. They're walking away from it. There's almost no salvage value for this, uh, this uh, thing that they built. It cost $28 million, and that money is gone. Um, they spent millions of dollars operating it. It's basically a $40 million write-off, and there's not a scintilla of accountability. No one uh, has to answer for any of this. Uh, in terms of what they've done with kids, in the last six years, 786 children have graduated, many without diplomas, while 1,141 have been removed. Now, those numbers are astounding. You read about Shelby, Tennessee, and the lady that puts the kid on the plane to uh, Russia, well, here you have a child care facility that's spending $110,000 per child per year, and they're shedding these kids left and right. And many of these kids are good kids. I could go through some of the stories for you. They track me down on the internet, and then I try to lobby for them. It's horrible. There's, you wouldn't kick these kids out for the kind of things that they're kicking them out for. They squandered millions on uh, an alumni campus, and why anyone would spend money on an alumni campus, um, about $10 million, should be a mystery. It's not. It's called uh, bribery, uh, because the alumni are the only ones that really care enough about this charity to uh, fight them. So uh, how do you uh, gut the alumni reform movement? Well, you, you buy them off. Uh, I've never set foot on it, uh, because I'm so uh, unhappy with, uh, the, the, with the, I, I can't believe that you spend money on this one. You've got needy kids out there. All right. They've spent $600 million on infrastructure. I'm just about done, so please bear with me. Uh, over the last six years, $600 million and the $400 million to centralize, that's a billion dollars, folks, in total infrastructure spending. And at the end of the day, what do they have? This is, the last uh, seven years is $1.5 million of infrastructure spending for each child added to enrollment. If you had 10 needy kids here and you spent, uh, what is it, $15 million uh, to house them, I mean, could you keep your job? It's, it's an absurd uh, metric. Uh, how do they do, get away with it? Total mystery. They have an astronomical media budget, which uh, also helps keep this uh, under wraps, including they commissioned a fake documentary, which you might see 
on uh, the Independent Film Channel. Um, we cannot possibly fight this. We have little pea shooters and are uh, in a tree, and they come out with basically the Sixth Fleet and destroy us. We're, as I said, we're like the Navi, but it doesn't end the way, uh, the way Cameron's film does. So notwithstanding all of this irrational spending, what did they just declare? Well, that they have a financial crisis. The new school president, uh, who replaced uh, the guy we were just describing earlier last year, please ask me about him at the end. I'd like to talk about that. Uh, he has announced that their enrollment growth promises won't be honored. They don't have enough money for it. Dental care for the kids is going to be cut back. Hiring of frontline staff, the most important uh, group at any child care facility, is going to be curtailed. Employees have reported dozens of programs have been cut, clubs, activities, student home travel budgets. We are told that they've even uh, uh, scrimped in some of the menu substitutions. This is notwithstanding over a billion dollars in unrestricted assets, according to the 2008 990. I have no idea where they come up with they don't have the money, but I don't buy it, and it wouldn't be the first time that they told whoppers. So uh, to really appreciate why this uh, broken promise on enrollment growth is so important, you need to look at the 40-year snapshot. Total assets versus number of children served. 1970, the trust had 187 million dollars. It served 1,550 children. 2010, 7.3 billion, serving 1,850. So, over 40 years, over seven billion dollars in, in assets were added, and for that money, they only added 300 uh, children. Why has that happened, and where has uh, the money gone? We've had uh, very prominent charitable trust scholars make, uh, make uh, comments on, on, on uh, 2002. You've heard me talk at length, but to close this out, we'll go back to the guy with a fourth grade education, uh, Mr. Hershey, who, uh, as the end of his life was approaching, uh, confided in his personal uh, physician and friend, Dr. H.H. H. Hostetter, telling him that he was worried about what would happen after he died, and here's what he said. If the wrong people or organization get control, they can spend or give away more money in a short uh, time than I have made in my life to build monuments unto themselves for their own financial gains, ego, and recognition, whose heads would swell and hearts would shrink, who would give to those who had plenty, and take away from those who had little or none. I submit that that's what has happened. This charity has uh, been taken over by stewards who cannot tell the difference between uh, needy kids and their own interests and their own non-child goals. Thank you so much for your attentiveness. I hope I didn't run on too long, and I hope that I didn't speak too quickly. Um, right, we're going to open this now to questions and discussion. If you could remember to switch on your uh, microphones uh, when you uh, want to say something. So who would like to begin? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, perhaps you're familiar with the Bishop Trust um, in Hawaii. Um, this is a trust, a charitable trust created by a descendant of the first king in Hawaii um, for the purposes of educating Hawaiian children. And anyway, after gross abuses by trustees um, that individuals didn't successfully challenge, the IRS saved the day. Um, they threatened to revoke the organization's tax exempt status and rapidly there was reform. So I'm curious, has the IRS gotten involved? Is that well, a possibility? Excellent question, excellent analogy. Bishop's estate is, in my view, the second largest scandal in the charitable trust world. So thank you for bringing it up. And yes, uh, I have uh, squealed to the IRS and I've been pleading with them to do something and, and I'm hoping that they will, but you know, you don't have any control over that. And by the way, I, I need to say something quickly that I, I neglected and shame on me. Um, I, I have co-counsel in Philadelphia, uh, uh, John Schmell of Dilworth Paxson, has been tremendous help to me. Uh, I couldn't do none of this without his assistance. I also have, we have an alumni researcher named uh, Joseph Burning, who's a class of 1973 auto mechanic, uh, one of the smartest, uh, most uh, well-educated guys on these issues, and uh, they've been invaluable. We also have a little teeny uh, group of uh, alumni who have uh, held out and have continued to press for reforms. That's a group called Protect the Hershey's Children. So about the Bishop's Estate again, if you saw the 60 Minutes documentary on Bishop's Estate, at the end of it, they asked one of the trustees who'd been ejected, if you had it to do again, what would you have done differently? He said, uh, we'd have bought the Honolulu Star Ledger. The, newspaper that exposed all this. Well, in 2002, when they kicked off all the 10 trustees and they added the four new ones, they 
Coincidentally, they added a former publishing editor of the local newspaper, a newspaper that has basically libeled uh, me, us. Uh, it's, they've made a mockery of any kind of credible reporting. Is there a connection between that? You tell me. I've scared everybody off. Malik, please. Are there some kind of um, restrictions on the number of children they can have? It's just really strange to have uh, such a low number of children for such a long period of time. None at all. Um, during one of our meetings with Attorney General Mike Fisher, he asked uh, me, how many children could you serve? And I said, I can't tell you off the top of my head. And I also was trying to tell him that it's not about how many children you serve in, in a residential child care program. It's how many children you serve using these resources the way you should, because we know now what we didn't know 100 years ago. But I said to him off the top of my head, oh, I don't know, 4,000 in this one facility. And by the way, I'm all for creating uh, more schools in different places, but uh, along the proper models. And when I said 4,000 children, he said, uh, the community will never allow that many of those kids uh, to live there. So I don't agree entirely with that. I think that many of the community have been very supportive of us, but uh, they're in the dark. I don't want to turn this into a uh, us versus them uh, debate, but I will say that uh, the community has benefited tremendously from the uh, misconduct of the trust board. Good question. Please. Thank you for... Um giving this presentation, it's powerful stuff. Um, I'm curious about the role of, of the leadership, the role of the Board of Trustees. I assume that Milton Hershey was chairman of the Board of Trustees when it started out, and that there was a progressive sh mission drift um, as trustees got moved out and new trustees got brought in. Can you talk a little bit about how that progressed? Excellent question, because that is why I say the seeds of the problem were sown in the original model that Mr. Hershey created. So long as he was alive and the people around him were in control, there was never any doubt about what this charity's mission was, and the school continued to grow. He died in 1945 before his body was cold. These guys were already thinking about how to uh, take assets away from needy kids. The first uh, you know, signal act was 1963 with the uh, medical center and that sea prey, which should have never happened. So by the 50s, they're already figuring out how do we get this money away from them. Now, the point is, it's a self-selecting board. They pick their own members. So if anybody acts up, they can have them removed or her removed. Um, they answer only the attorney general. And as you've seen, it, look, if these guys were wearing ski masks and carrying guns, this would be easy. Everyone would be all over this. But they're wearing business suits and you know, black tie cocktail party attire. So uh, not the kind of people that are easy to rein in. And they, they select themselves. And you saw what happened when we went to the court and said, what, what about these reforms? I mean, uh, that was quite a spanking that was delivered to us, I must tell you. So uh, I have said that they shouldn't be allowed to self-select. I have said, why don't we have uh, you know, Annie B. Casey Foundation appoint uh, one of the trustees and maybe, maybe uh, Girls in Boys Town and maybe uh, I'd say Professor Bartholet. I mean, there are so many ways to put this board together so that it's, 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 inter it's interested in, in children. By the way, I'm not joking about that. I've said that we should be looking out to the people who understand childcare, even where they don't agree. I'd rather have a, a very, very strong uh, adoption advocate with a very, very strong uh, family preservation advocate with a, with a perhaps a, a model children's home advocate fight it out on a board because then we know we're going to get policies for kids. What we have now is basically a bunch of local politicians and insiders and the only arguments they have is what you know uh, when are we going to have tea time tomorrow and either, do we need this golf course? So it's a good question and that's the, the fundamental problem with this board is the governance and the, the, uh, the leadership and the way that they self-select. They, they're insular, they're arrogant, they answer to no one. We wrote them and said well you know you're making these childcare cutbacks why don't you cut some of your your pay. They didn't even acknowledge receipt of our letter. I write them letters pleading about kids that break your heart. These kids should have never uh, faced what they faced. I had one kid who was kicked out after they punished these kids by taking away their personal possessions. And why they would do that, total mystery. He had a crucifix when he resisted them taking that. He hit the point limit for uh, enrollment review. It's 100 points. They stuck him in isolation in a health center for uh, 17 days while a star chamber enrollment review panel decided to expel him. Lovely kid. He's just a nice guy. Why would you kick a kid out for something like this? I wrote them. I write them about all these things. 
They don't even acknowledge getting my letter. It's letters. Um, when you can get away with everything because the state's attorney general literally will do nothing for these kids, you know, basically they just run, like I say, tr uh, trustees run wild. It looks like there's a lot of corruption at the state level, but uh, I guess to reiterate the question there, there must be some way to go down from the federal level and, and enforce maybe some laws to, to review the cor corrupt actions of the attorney general and all these things. I mean, the, there must be some sort of accountability above the state level that, that can be enforced. Um, and, and maybe the strategy is to lobby in Washington and in Congress and, and to whoever appoints uh, to these people there. Excellent question for a law school student because this is a law school and we're supposed to believe in the you know, principles of justice and, and so forth and so on. But I have to tell you, it's, it's pretty disturbing. Um, we have uh, very distinguished not-for-profit law scholars here today. We have Marion Fremont Smith and, uh, and Lori Spitzer. And what they said uh, during one class was, you know, you're better off getting a New York Times article written. And the truth is uh, public uh, exposure is the best hope because you know, um, I, I don't want to say something that's, that's too flippant about the local courts, but uh, I have seen nothing that gives me confidence that, uh, you know, that things will improve. Sad to say. So I'm wondering, it's a little along the lines of the question about the IRS, of sort of how, how much you've tried to get allies to get other, you know, to get nonprofit child rights organizations, there's some in Pennsylvania. It just seems as if that, if you could get some relatively powerful allies in there with you, then there's more of a prayer of the media paying attention, of the courts paying attention. Well, uh, excellent question and uh, complicated answer. First of all, um, you know, everybody here is uh, basically Harvard community, uh, you know, law students, uh, Kennedy School. And I think, I hope that you could track the, uh, the thread of this. I hope that I was able to explain it so that people, it's complicated. No one wants to touch it. You try to explain it to them and, and their, their, their eyes glaze over. So number one, the complexity is, it's very hard to explain what's going on. Number two, that complexity is shattered when um, you saw the Academy Awards. Remember the commercial that ran, the Hershey uh, chocolate commercial? You know, uh, buy Hershey chocolate and help a needy kid. I could sit here and do 10 of these lectures. All they have to do is flash one picture of three kids smiling, and everybody wants to hunt me down because I'm a bad guy. I mean, you know, image is everything. And they've got an unlimited re uh, uh, advertising budget. So we get burned on that. Um, I go to the, I've gone to the child care advocacy groups, um, you know, Children's Rights Inc., which I think is a phenomenal group, and I've tried to tell them, do you realize how much foster care money we could tap here, how many foster care children we could be serving and should be serving? We could be, for example, we could take group homes that are under, underfunded and poorly staffed, and we could give those kids better clothes, we could give them tutors, we could give them dental care, and I can't get them to understand it because they're overwhelmed with, you know, with class actions in various states. So a lot of it is fall between the cracks, and then let me tell you a mea culpa here, okay? Um, the reality is, uh, you know, I'm a lousy politician. I'm a lousy organizer. I can understand these issues and I can talk about them, but um, I, I'm not very good at this mass campaign part of it. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, be coy, but you know, you've got to get people mobilized and it's very hard to do. Um, we're a very small group. A lot of us have been, you know, uh, bled white resource wise. We take time away from our personal lives, from our day jobs, and you know, we're, we're overwhelmed. Now, that, that's kind of a whimpery, uh, woe is me, but by the same token, uh, 10 years later, I'm still in the game fighting them, and uh, you know, we keep persevering. We're trying to learn better, and th now that you mentioned it, let me say one more thing. Coming to Harvard for me was, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful, because I, I needed to get away from it, and I needed to rethink all these issues, but I also wanted to package uh, what I knew in a way that others could understand. And this is a kind of a coming out party for me. It's my first time speaking in any public forum in a way that I try to put it all together. So this talk is going to be uh, video uh, cast on our little teeny website. And we're hoping that the ripples will start to expand, that more people get interested because, frankly speaking, we have enough resources, this trust has enough resources to change the face of childcare, not only across the state of Pennsylvania, but across the country. 
I mean, we could be saving children's lives on a, on a different order of magnitude with these resources. So I don't know if I answered your question properly, but you know, number one, it's complicated. Number two, the other child care advocacy groups don't understand you know, how they can uh, get into it. Number three, they've got this huge advertising budget. Number four, you know, we are, we've been described as the ragtag orphan army. Um, you know, I have to tell you something, when the good Lord wants to punish you, uh, he or she makes you represent orphanage alumni on a pro bono basis. I mean, it, it is like herding cats. And then the trustees are very clever. They show up with a bag of catnip. Oh, you want a job? You want a contract? And, you know, I, I'm not the most patient guy. I'm not the most tolerant person. You know, you, you basically reach your limits with, with, with these guys. We're, we're doing our best, but, um, you know, I, I don't know what to say. And, and in the midst of all that, we're trying to have lies. We're living out tragedies. And some of us are, you know, frankly speaking, it's almost touching but scary because a lot of these people, myself included, then have these, you know, we fall through these trap doors and we go back to what our childhood experiences were. Last semester when I started doing this stuff, I had a couple of moments during classes when uh, I, mean, I, I was, you know, uh, dysfunctional. I, could, I, I skipped classes a couple of days because you, you, you know, I never wanted to learn this stuff about residential child care or child trust laws. It's not my problem. I had a wonderful little commercial law practice. I flew onto the radar screen. I was really happy. I went to the opera and then I got sucked into this mess. Uh, you, you know, who needs it? So we do our best. Um, this was a very illuminating presentation and you've probably no doubt convinced everyone in this room that there's something very wrong going on and that these people in control of the board are acting in a very morally wrong manner. But aside from perhaps incorrectly claiming charitable tax exempt status, what are they doing that's illegal? That's a very good question. Um, very, very good question. Whew. Well, first of all, I'll say that I, I don't know if I would say that what they're doing is immoral. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to quibble, but uh, I, I don't want to engage in just simple aspersion. Yeah, I think that some of these people have acted uh, horribly, and maybe sometimes, but m broad picture, I think that they've acted wrongly. I think that they've also acted unlawfully because, let's do this legally, there are three duties of any not-for-profit uh, director, a duty of uh, uh, adequate care, reasonable care, duty of uh, uh, loyalty, and duty of obedience to the charitable mission. And I think that what you look at is that they've strayed from these duties. The Attorney General's subordinates, you know, to their credit, declared that they were in breach of these duties in 2002 when the reform agreement was executed. And that's why the reform agreement was executed. So um, there are uh, legal mechanisms, but the problem is this. It's uh, the attorney general enforces this charity and the attorney general makes choices. So the attorney general says, I don't see a problem here. And you bring it to a court and you try to say that there is a problem, the judge says no. There's a, you know, there's a, this give between what we think is right and what a judge or a, uh, an attorney general thinks is right. I believe it's improperly influenced by the old boys network in central Pennsylvania. They think that I'm a radical nut job from New York who should be quiet and let them run their charity the way they want to. So if you talk to them and they were up here talking, they would describe to you this short, -headed, this short bald uh, critter from New York who won't leave us alone. He keeps haranguing us. And uh, even the attorney general, by the way, uh, thinks that I'm uh, somewhat of a pain in the ass. Uh, Warren, um, uh, Professor Elizabeth Warren, a couple of weeks ago talked about loudmouths and I wanted to jump up and yell, you know, hooray for the loudmouths. They're the only ones that improve the world for us. So. Rick, I'm wondering if you have, hi, I'm wondering if um, in this current uh, era of power failures with respect to corporate governance, where I think there is a greater public recognition of what's wrong uh, with institutional stewardship, even if it's hard to identify what should be done, although there are many reform efforts going on. Uh, if you've considered uh, the use of interactive technology or social media or other digital tools to sort of get that message across with respect to this being a charitable foundation subject to state oversight, many of the power breakdown, power failures that you cite um, are almost exact replicas of the sort of thing that inspire moral outrage with respect to corporate governance. Have you thought about tying it to, to that bandwagon and then secondly using interactive tools as a way, a very cheap and effective and reliable way of broadening the message? And there might be some volunteers here or at the Berkman Center who could help you with that. Yeah, Marcia, excellent question. And um, 
Number one, uh, interestingly enough, at the time that the 2002 reform package was being uh, rescinded, or executed and then rescinded, you had reforms across the country, Global Crossing, WorldCom, Enron, everybody was talking about reform. This is the only instance where a corporate board had reforms forced on it and then was permitted to rescind it. And the rescission occurred with the agreement of the Attorney General whose cronies then ended up profiteering from rescinding it. It's an outrage. The difference is all those other, all those other Global Crossing, Enron, um, uh, WorldCom, public, public shareholders uh, took it in the chin. So uh, these are needy kids. Needy kids don't vote, they don't lobby, uh, they don't make campaign contributions. Basically, uh, you know, and this is interesting because the, the, you know, I spared you some of the, the legal history, but we actually reversed that trial court judge at the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania. A remarkable decision. And the court found that the alumni were the only group with any interest in enforcing this charity on behalf of needy kids. They will get their day in court. They will be heard. And I mean, we're doing cartwheels because I thought, boy, l let them try to defend this rescission. It's a, it's, it's a lead pipe cinch. Then we went up to the state Supreme Court and it wasn't quite as bad a spanking as we had in the trial court, but the result was the same. I skipped all that. So uh, the answer is that it's a different class that's being um, hurt. And, but the other part of your, your question is, is excellent. Uh, even if uh, people's pocketbooks are not being affected, needy kids are being hurt. And if you can convey that, um, if you can convey that, then uh, uh, basically people might get inspired. And again, um, you know, we got beat up pretty badly, but uh, we're still here. And this is part of uh, the, you know, the, the communicating that to the general public. That's a great question. Thank you. Brody. Please. I was wondering if you, you spoke earlier to the power of um, publicity, essentially, as a, as a tool. I was wondering whether you would draw any other lessons for nonprofit governance uh, from this case and, and the failure, essentially, to, to seek reform. Yeah, lots and lots of uh, uh, lessons. One is that I think that uh, you know, the general public needs to be more alert about what uh, charities are doing. The uh, not-for-profit boards have organized themselves in the lobbies and they're changing laws and making this kind of stuff possible uh, so it's getting easier for them. So I, I think that I'd like to see more not-for-profit groups spring up like uh, 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 Charitable Trust Navigator and uh, you know, these watchdog groups that spring up and get some minimal funding and then expose this kind of uh, uh, behavior is one of our best safeguards uh, against uh, the perpetuation of this behavior. So I think we need to lobby uh, more effectively. I think we need to expose uh, these issues uh, in the general public. Is that an answer? If we've got time for just one last question. Okay. Rick, when I listen to your speech, I, and one thinks about the culpability involved here, I suppose there's, there's a couple of levels of culpability the, at the trustees level, then at the attorney general's level for not enforcing this, and then I suppose one could even conceivably say at the non-profit law level for kind of enforcing this structure where there really isn't anybody who, to whom these people are accountable. Um, so a couple of questions about this. First of all, have you, you know, it's clear that you kind of, that the trustees aren't responsive, but the Attorney General, um, is it possible to either try and bring some political power to bear on the current Attorney General or in the likely event that the Pennsylvania Attorney General is going to change office after the elections later this year, um, affect the new Attorney General? And, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the current Attorney General, you know, to, not to besmirch the conversation with political politics, but the current Attorney General being a Republican, possibly being a gubernatorial candidate in 2010, you know, can you, could you hitch your wagon maybe to the, a possible Democratic candidate and try and bring to, to light some of the abuses that have gone on? Great question. Um, uh, the, the joke in not-for-profit uh, scholarship uh, circles is that AG doesn't mean Attorney General, it means aspiring governor. And in 2002, when Mike Fisher uh, rescinded these reforms and kicked these trustees off, he was running for governor. Uh, in fact, he was actually uh, doing fundraising at one of the well, you know, wrongdoing companies while he was supposed to be investigating the charity. It was a joke. The current attorney general, Republican Tom Corbett, is also running for governor. And so, but the narrow answer to the question is yes, we absolutely intend to make this an issue in the election. We may lose, um, but we basically have given up on him. I mean, he doesn't even answer our correspondence. Of course, we may have become a little bit shrill over time. When they're kicking out 
on average, every single school day, more than one child every year, and you see this over and over, you get, a little, you get angry when the attorney general doesn't, doesn't act. Uh, I'm very frustrated with the AG, so you know, they may have reason for thinking that I'm somewhat hostile to them, but we fully plan to air this. <laughs> Boy, uh, yeah, no one who's heard of me in class would doubt that. So um, we fully plan to air uh, this conduct and ask J uh, Tom Corbett to explain himself. Um, uh, uh, full disclosure. Uh, I was so upset with them for um, when they named this last school president. The, the last school president that they named was a recycled trustee. He was responsible for virtually every bad decision over the last 10 years, from rejecting the neediest kids, to crowding the kids, to rescinding the reform agreement, to hiring the guy with the falsified credentials, to all this stuff that we've seen. And they had a fake nationwide search. They spent a ton of money on it. They said, oh, after a nationwide search, this guy right here, this little insider, is the guy. It was furious. And at that point, I, I uh, asked Tom Corbett to debate the issues in public, which probably didn't uh, do my, uh, my uh, uh, standing with him any good. But at that point, I felt like it, it can't get any worse now that they've given us this guy. I mean, I literally had held out thinking that when they got rid of the past uh, president, that we'd have a change in administration and things would improve for the better. Uh, we had uh, signals that they were actually doing a credible search. And then they, 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 it was a mockery naming this guy. I mean, everybody who's seen it just burst out laughing. Frankly speaking, you know, the Attorney General's own office uh, thought it was a joke that they named this guy as president. But you know, you can't do anything when the, uh, the uh, Attorney General is running for governor and he's depending on uh, this uh, Republican stalwart uh, to help him out. So that's about it, huh? We have reached time. Thank you all very much. Very I gracious. I'd like to thank Rick for an excellent presentation. And um, I look forward to the next installment because I feel there is going to be a next installment. And I have a more successful next installment. So thank you very much. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you.